Paul, once I think once you said that when you started to write, you stopped fishing. And you also were talking about how much you loved fishing. So is writing like fishing? Uh, both require a great deal of patience. You've got to have, uh, unless you're a fly fisherman, you have to have a good deal of, of shall we say, sit slice, be able to sit for a long time and uh, be rather quiet. But I, my, I enjoyed fishing because it was about the only time, as I was growing up, the only time uh, when my father and I had, uh, were, could be complete colleagues. Otherwise, Dad uh, really, as he admitted, he really never understood me. He hoped that I would become uh, expected, it just, he, because he did. He left a farm, he left a family tradition. Farming went way back. Uh, he left a farm to become a uh, uh, one of the early auto mechanics on the combustion engine uh, uh, in Jackson County, Missouri, in Independence, Kansas City. Uh, and he, uh, uh, his, I think the only reading I can recall my father ever doing was the Saturday Evening Post. But there was another side of me. It wasn't when the garage was him, with him. We had this kindred association fishing. But uh, the other side of me was books and writing. I got really caught up in writing. I was getting a very good reputation in high school um, and uh, won an essay contest, became editor of the uh, high school newspaper. This was all in the uh, early, very early days before I became vulnerable to the draft in World War II. And uh, Dad could see my heart just wasn't in box wrenches and end wrenches and whether we should uh, do this to the carburetor and uh, uh, flush the uh, radiator, you know, those important matters. And so one day Dad just straightened up, looked at me and said, ah, go on to your books. In a kindly paternal way, but I'm a little disappointed. So <laughs> I didn't walk away, I ran. <laughs> and uh, when I moved up, I came up to Minnesota after World War II and went to the university, I'd go, uh, I'd go north and fish. I had some friends and then Joanne and I got to be pals and uh, <laughs> I don't think Joanne knew uh, 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 one kind of lure from another, but uh, she being a special kind of lure herself. But anyway, so she went along and we'd go up and, and uh, go fishing. But fishing remained and finally phased out of my life because any spare time I had as the years went on, I didn't give to fishing. I get was time to writing, and writing becomes. And I, I would say this to all those who are persons who think of being that they're called to be a writer or want to write fiction, nonfiction, unless you don't mind giving up weekends when you're on when things are going well the writing is going well uh, or you wake up in the middle of the night and an idea occurs to you uh, better think again maybe writing is not for you so uh, it's a I think a, a writer is uh, borrow something from the uh, fishing lingo the writer's hook he really, she, he or she really is hooked, and you better be prepared for that. If it's if it's if if it's part of you, then be grateful and go after it. And I should point out here before I forget uh, to anyone who's interested in writing: look, you never, never, please make the mistake of considering your editor an enemy, an in person, an intrusive force. Don't do it. Your best buddy. Your best friend is your editor. Um, I called it One Nation Indivisible. 
the Union in American Thought, and I began in 1776 when the idea of uh, a confederation somehow bringing together these disparate uh, in many ways highly different ex-colonies now independent states. You know, I took it down to 1861 when the Union's nature, and that's an awful thing to remember, but the nature of the Union was so crucial in American thinking, and this explains how and why, uh, that uh, the, we had a national slaughterhouse for four years in that awful thing we call the American Civil War. It's easy to get sentimental about it, but it was just a dreadful business. What war isn't, actually? Well, after I did that, and that this was uh, got well reviewed, um, and and this did a great deal to uh, establish me uh, uh, as a successful scholar in American history. Tenure was no longer a worry. Well, after I finished this, I decided that there was another book to be dredged out of all this, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> really something that goes beyond Union, and that's something rather more mystical, the Union. You know, we could talk about uh, all 13 <coughs> states in the first, <coughs> excuse me, the, in the first, uh, in the early years. But then, so I, the next book I published was uh, something that I, the, the sense of nationality. And I called it the Sacred Trust. American nationality, and especially the built around, by and large, uh, the uh, theme that comes down from colonial days until uh, really the um, sort of evaporates after the Spanish-American War. That's why it ends in, 17, in 1898. And that is that the American community, the American nation, uh, was uh, really a... Uh, a great symbol here in the New World, uh, a symbol calling the rest of the world to follow in the path of freedom, uh, liberty, individualism, all the things that are uh, part of the sometimes gibberish of nationality. Nationalism can be a wholesome thing. It can be a very evil kind of uh, uh, setting. It sets people uh, to war. Um, in, my, in this case, you use everything. You use, new, as I was saying earlier, uh, orations, sermons, the kind of expression of sentiment that you find uh, when uh, uh, this uh, could trace through uh, newspaper editorials, letters to the press, uh, um, certain kinds of literature, poetry, yeah. Uh, so you use, uh, and even congressional debates, well, I shouldn't say even, certainly congressional debates. So you go through exp expressions of sentiment, and uh, out of that you draw, uh, you coalesce, as it were, uh, ideas. And I think one of the reasons I became a good biographer is that I was able to take snippets of sentiment, keeping the quotation and the source clearly in mind, snippets of sentiment, and use them in building uh, uh, a uh, structure uh, 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 for ideology. Uh, the uh, Oxford had published the Lee, the Women, uh, and it had published uh, and it was publishing the Lee book. Uh, and I always thought, well, I've always been intrigued by Henry Adams, and that's, he's a, a, that would be a very different kind of book. There are lots of books about Henry. Am I, do it? I want to add one more to the, to the lengthening list? And I was thinking about that at breakfast, Joanne and I. We were still, at that time, still in uh, Richmond. This was about uh, 1990. Uh, 1980, uh, 87, I guess. And the phone rang. And it was, once again, that great figure in 
20th century Adams family lore, Thomas Boylston Adams. And he said, I can hear, still hear his voice now. He, he looked like an Adams. He talked like an Adams. The other members of the family who remembered some of these older, who remembered some of their forebears, like Charles Francis. And so, well, Tom said, Tom, Tom, Paul Nagel. And he said, Paul, it's Tom Adams. I said, hello, Tom. I hear you finished your Lee book. Yeah, okay. Now, he said, it's time for you to write a biography, the way you write biographies, to write a biography of John Quincy Adams. I said, well, I said, oh, okay, Tom, I'll think about it. I said, I've thought about Henry. No, 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 leave Uncle Henry out. He said, write about JQA. So I did, and had a great time at that. Um, again, you know, you've got this tremendous biography. You've got a life so complex and so compelling. You know, the fact he was president is, <laughs> it's hard to believe, but it's a kind of, it's almost a trivial fa aspect to the life of a guy who devoted, as he was, to science, to poetry, to history. Uh, just a tremendous mind and a tremendous person and a very difficult person who had as wife, I think, uh, one of the great women in American history. Is there anyone you'd like to have over for a chat? Well, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. Um, I'd like to spend uh, as much time as uh, heaven would, uh, will, would let her be, uh, be absent uh, with Louisa Catherine Johnson Adams the wife of John Quincy Adams, um, she had, when she left a vivid account of how she uh, felt, uh, the, and particularly her life in, uh, in Washington, not only as the wife of the Secretary of State and of the President and of a congressman, but uh, uh, thereafter, uh, and she outlived him by several years. And she and Dolly Madison were the uh, eminent uh, hostesses in Washington. She, she had an eye for the, uh, the real, the reality of politics and politicians that is unrivaled. Uh, and when she died, uh, the Congress of the United States adjourned in her memory, first time they had done that uh, in uh, the history of the institution. But, for example, it would be wonderful just to have her talk about her famous uh, journey uh, during, uh, from uh, the uh, uh, capital of St. Petersburg, then the capital of Russia, to uh, Paris, uh, overland with a six-year-old son, and who, uh, well, he was six, yeah, yeah, six years old, Charles Francis Adams, stagecoach. Uh, and uh, I talk about that in the biography of JQA, but uh, she was, uh, she, courage, courage itself when really was tough. You bet she, she was stopped because it, it, she was stopped by French troops because the Napoleonic Wars were still raging. And she uh, uh, had spoke perfect French, or spoke French perfectly. She leaned out of her carriage and addressed the troops in their own language. <laughs> said, Madame, Madame, go on, go on. Uh, to, have, to be able to hear her tell that story, because she, that account never really got into her records. So that's a gap there. And then that very morning when he went, to, went off to the capital to denounce the war with Mexico, and uh, he never came home because he toppled over, JQA congressman toppled over from a stroke, and they carried him into the speaker's chamber. And they called Mrs. Adams, and she was there. He didn't know anyone, didn't know her, and uh, she didn't leave any record of that. So there are little gaps, but that's, she's the person.